These are strange times that you and I are living in. I heard about a couple who had a conversation during this quarantine. And she said to him, do you think I'm as skinny as when the quarantine began? His response, oh, you were never skinny even before the quarantine. They listed his cause of death as the coronavirus. Well, it's a weird world that we live in these days. And many of us have been under some kind of a stay-at-home order for a significant period of time. Our lives have been very different than we ever thought they might be even just 90 days ago. But we have a precedent in the Word of God. God always has something to say to His people. He always has a story in Scripture that in some ways parallels the story of our life at the present. In fact, there are many places in the Word of God that we might go in a time like this to discover when God's people were at flashpoint. They were at some moment of crisis, something they never anticipated, something that could not have been foreseen, and something that demanded the immediate intervention of Almighty God, just as you and I are experiencing here today. And I might say that the outbreak that we are experiencing could indeed be the outbreak of the Spirit of God. Could it be that the very thing that plagues the human race could even be the power that redeems the human race? God works all things together for our good. To those who love Him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He makes even the wrath of men to praise him, and he restrains the remainder of wrath. What others mean for evil, God means for good. And many times throughout history, God has worked in rather unusual ways to bring about great things for his people and even greater things for those who are about to become his people. And so we shall pray that this outbreak is an outbreak of the Spirit of God for which many of us have been praying and longing now for a great number of decades. Here in the United States, we are 150 years overdue for a great spiritual awakening. And it may be that we will see more souls ushered into the kingdom in these days than we have witnessed at any time in our lifetime, perhaps even in the history of Christianity within this nation. But back to what I said a moment ago. God often speaks to his people because he has spoken to his people in the past. God often teaches his people because he's taught his people in the past. God often buoys his people because he's buoyed his people in the past. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And in these moments today, I hope to say something to you that may be of encouragement to you about how that one may be shut down and yet shut up. Shut down by men, but shut up unto God. And I might say to you that to be shut down by the world and find ourselves shut up unto God is a place of blessing and not cursing. The story that I want to re-familiarize you with today comes out of the ministry of Elisha. Elisha, the successor and former servant of Elijah, was given a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And Elisha had twice as many recorded miracles as did his preacher predecessor, Elijah. One of those miracles is found in the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Kings. It is a very short story in Scripture, short in length, but long on truth. 
telling us about a widow who found herself desperate for redemption from a creditor and how that God intervened to bring about a solution to her problem and in that solution, a telling set of truths for us even today about being shut down and yet shut up unto God. Let me stir up your minds by way of remembrance by reading the passage. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. Elisha asked her, What can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all of your neighbors. Do not just get a few. Then go in and shut the door. Shut down. Shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all of these containers set the full ones on one side so she left after she had shut the door behind her and her sons they kept bringing her containers and she kept pouring when they were full she said to her son bring me another container but he replied there aren't any more then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. Shut down by men, but shut up unto God. How is it that one can be shut down and yet shut up unto God? Well, oftentimes, there is a sorrowing factor. Here was a woman, apparently recently widowed. A woman who had been faithful to a man, faithful to the servant of God, and faithful to the God of that servant. A woman fortunate enough to be married to a man who feared the Lord and who served the Lord. He was numbered among the school of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, who were more biblical sons of Elisha than biological sons of Elisha. Men who were training to tell the truth. Men who were being ready to minister to the nation. Men who were preparing for a nation that was unwilling to prepare for her God. Men who were studying the Word of God when few in the land cared for the Word of God. And her husband had died. Ostensibly, he was a somewhat young man. He had two sons living at home. And the widow had no provision without her preacher husband. She found herself in a place of stress and distress. She found herself grieving the loss of her husband and now discovering that she had other encumbrances in life as well. Grief can master us, but oftentimes the grieving process is encumbered with other processes. Most of us who have gone through a grieving process have found that we were somewhat short-circuited in our sorrow because there were other things that demanded our attention. Sometimes these things may be a mercy from God to give us something upon which to focus rather than to wallow in self-pity. But at other times, these things keep us from working our way through a necessary process of bereavement. Here was a woman who may have been startled 
not only by the death of her husband, but by the financial extremity she now faced as a widow. And oftentimes, you and I discover that God does His most precious, His most personal, His most profound, His most powerful work in our lives at the very point of our sorrow. Our God is no sunny day Savior. He is a very present help to those who are in distress. Our Lord Jesus Christ is not a high priest untouched by our infirmities, but is instead a sympathetic Savior who knows how to nurse the hurts and the pains of His people. A God who comes running to his people in times not only of their stress but their sorrow who comes to his people when they are in grief grief and God are not far apart in your dictionary and they are never far apart in the word of God beleaguered soul hemorrhaging heart let me say to you that if this day and hour finds you in the midst of sorrow. Don't waste your sorrow. Find the God of all grace and all consolation in your sorrow and let him minister to you in this moment. There is often a sorrowing factor. 